Hello, thank you for joining me once again. We are on day 74 and we're going to look at the three letters um, by John. Uh, one, two, first, second and third John, um, which uh, is very nearly at the end of the Old Test at uh, the New Testament. Let me start um, by reading these words from T.F. Johnson, who wrote um, the Understanding the Bible commentary on this particular, um, on these letters. He says this, the letters of John in the New Testament are treasured for their memorable teaching on love and forgiveness. Yet they were written in the midst of one of the fiercest conflicts in first century Christianity. The same author who wrote God is love, 1, 4, 1 John 4, 8. And since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Um, 4 verse 11, or we love because he first loved us, 4 verse 19, also wrote, many antichrists have come. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, 1 John 2, 18 to 19. And we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are, 1 John 3 verse 10. And many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is the spirit of antichrist, 1 John 4 verses 1 and 3. There is real conflict raging. That's the end of the quotation, but that sets us up really for what's going on in all three of these letters. Uh, and we'll come back to that theme and look at that theme a bit more in a few minutes. First of all, we're going to do the um, traditional thing. We're going to talk about who wrote it and in what situation. Um, so the three letters seem to be written by the same person, um, calls himself John the Elder. Um, and the key question really is, is this the author of the gospel, of the fourth gospel? Um, and there are similarities and differences between um, the writing here and the writing of the fourth gospel. Um, I haven't studied this uh, in uh, deeply as uh, New Testament scholars do. Um, to me, the uh, similarities are very striking and I'm not so sure of the dis differences, but that's, um, as I say, that's me as an Old Testament specialist um, commenting on something that's really rather outside above my pay grade. Um, so one scholar that I read suggests that um, these letters emerge from the Johannine community, which is a kind of community, a church, a community of churches that um, were probably pastored by John and hold on to the Johannine tradition, um, who probably edited John's gospel. Um, and hence we get chapter 21, which feels like an addition because it feels like it ended at the end of chapter 20. And, and chapter 21 contains that um, we know that this testimony is true, which sounds like the voice of a community authenticating the rest of it, um, if that makes sense. So, so that's that's the idea of the Johannine community kind of pushing the finishes touches on, on, on John's gospel. And then the elder who writes these um, letters is part of that community. Um, and so they are part of, they are part of the same circle. They are part of the same thought world. Um, on the other hand, I read other scholars who feel um, pretty strongly that this is written by the same person who wrote the, um, the fourth gospel. Um, and we note in particular that there is a claim right at the beginning of, of 1 John 1 to be an eyewitness once again. So I'm going to stick with this person being John, um, the uh, beloved disciple. Um, but we can't be sure, as, uh, as with quite a few other things to do with authorship in the New Testament. OK, what do we know about this character, John, if it is he who wrote it? Um, so after Christ's ascension, John remained uh, for some time at Jerusalem um, and um, he's referred to in Galatians um, chapter 2, verse 9. Let me just read you this. Uh, this verse. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a pause part of an extended argument. I won't read you the whole thing to make the sentence, but he says, when James and Peter and Cephas, that's Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, pillars of the church, that is, uh, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship. Um, so John is described as a pillar of the church. Um, and although um, the, church is, the church in Jerusalem is led by Peter and James, um, Luke, um, in Acts, Luke um, includes the, the actions of John. You may remember that in um, that, P that uh, Peter and John go to the temple to pray and, and heal a lame man on the way. Now, it may well be that John remained in Jerusalem um, for a long while. That's uh, the best guess we can reconstruct is that, that what's happened is that that's what happened. Um, and certainly John lived to a good old age. 
Um, but as the um, as the rebellion, which uh, resulted ultimately in the destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple, as that rebellion and and kind of war um, started to uh, erupt, um, many believers, including the apostles, left Jerusalem um, because they they understood that Jesus had said that that they should do so. So Mark thirteen, um, verse fourteen says this and this is mark mark 13 we talked about when we were in the gospel of mark quite an extended discussion um of uh, kind of a number of end times things um 13 verse 14 when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains and so in obedience to that the apostles then left the city when they considered that um, the abomination that causes desolation had happened when um, when the temple is desecrated. Um, and at that point, uh, we think John would have left the city. And uh, there is really good tradition um, in the early church that he then made Ephesus his base of operation um, and really became the pastor of the churches in that region. Um, so Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp and Polycarp was a disciple of John so this is a, a very early tradition and a, a very well based tradition. Um, Irenaeus tells us that the apostle continued um, in Ephesus until the time of the emperor Trajan. Well Trajan didn't come to the throne until AD 98 um, so not quite sure how long John lived after that but clearly John lived to a ripe old age and um, and and pastor the church in that time. Um, he would have therefore have had a huge degree of authority as being the last um, remaining, uh, last remaining apostle, the last remaining eyewitness of um, Jesus's earthly ministry. Um, and um, it's likely that these letters, these three letters that he writes, um, are the last scriptures to be written. Um, and uh, probably in about AD 85 to 95. So he was a a good old man at that time. There's a lovely story. Now, this isn't from scripture, so we're not absolutely sure about it, but there is a, a, a tradition in the early church, a story from the early church, that um, the Apostle John, when he was a very old man, um, obviously everyone wanted to hear stories of Jesus and everyone wanted to hear him teach, and, and they'd bring him, maybe kind of wheel him, as it were, into the, into the congregation sometimes, and they'd say, John, John, tell us the stories of Jesus. And he'd kind of look around the congregation and he'd say, brothers and sisters love one another and uh and when he said this a few times they'd say okay yes but john john tell us tell us the stories of jesus and tell us more teach us and he'd just look around and go just love one another <laughs> which i think is a wonderful story and um and we, we see that in these letters actually um now, if, if um, John is based in Ephesus at this point, um, then the sort of things that we learnt about Ephesus when we were looking at um, the letters of Paul to Timothy, um, and indeed when we looked at the letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus, um, will be relevant to us here in terms of understanding a little bit about the situation that he's facing. Having said that, he's writing considerably later. Um, and... Um, as, I, as I've already outlined, he's addressing heresy. He's addressing um, significant doctrinal misteaching within the church. And um, as, the, as time progressed, those heresies became more sophisticated and more subtle. And so he is here dealing with a more sophisticated and subtle heresy than um, sorts of things that Paul is dealing with in his letters, um, which are earlier. Um, so these three letters, um, the first um, letter from John is a general letter. It's not addressed to anyone in particular. Um, we don't know if he had a specific audience. It feels more like um, a letter perhaps to the churches in a whole area to be to be taken around with circular letter, as we've seen a few times now. Um, second John is addressed to a specific congregation. Um, it's addressed to um, the elect lady and her children. Now, this is kind of code for um, the church, the church being the, the, the idea of kind of mother church, as it were, um, mother church and um, possibly daughter congregations around. Or it may just be the members of that church who would be regarded kind of as the children of the mother church, as it were. So it's addressed to the to the elect lady and her children. And at the end, um, in verse 13, it's only one, it's only 13 verses long. Um, the children of your elect sister greet you. 
Um, and this is probably referring to wherever it is that John is based. Um, and so this is, he's in a sister church, if you like, um, and he sends greetings from that church to the one he's addressing. And this is a kind of code to, um, to make the letter seem more innocent um, to any, anyone who were to intercept it, I think. And then third John is addressed to an individual, someone called Gaius, uh, about whom we know um, nothing really, except what we can conjecture from the letter, or extrapolate from the letter. So John is writing all three of these letters um, with regard to um, heresy. Um, and uh, we're going to look at that now. Um, so uh, the longest and uh, most detailed of these letters is the first and we'll spend longest on that one. So in First John, we have two central statements about God's nature. Um, in 1 verse 5, we have God is light and in him there is no darkness at all, which is beautiful. And in 4 verses 8 and 16, we have twice God is love. God is light and God is love. And we could, if you want to meditate on something today. Maybe that's what you want to stick with and meditate on. <clears throat> um, now, what's going on in the church that um, John is needing to write this letter about heresy? Um, well, it's it's what's called the Gnostic heresy. Now, we have spoken about the Gnostics um, before. I can't remember which book we were in when we were talking about it, I'm afraid. It might have been John's Gospel, actually. Um, so... Um, we know from, uh, I think it's from Irenaeus actually, that um, that John is particularly addressing the teaching of a Jewish Gnostic called Corinthus, who was based uh, in in this, wherever, in this place that John is writing to, or in this area. Um, and and Corinthus's theology is, is centered on imaginative speculations um, about the origin of the universe, um, loosely based on Jesus Christ, but with no attention to the historical details of his life you know those kind of minor matters like his birth and his teaching and his life and his death and his resurrection none of those things really bothered Corinthus um, he's 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 using kind of the idea of Jesus um, to build construct this um, fanciful um, speculation um, along along Gnostic lines now do you remember the idea of Gnosticism is that um, the physical is tainted is is corrupt and um, and essentially if we could shed it that would be great um, and we are trying to attain to a greater knowledge um, some kind of some kind of mystical um, understanding that we, we are sort of striving towards and um, the idea of the Gnostic teachers was that they kind of spoke down the ladder from a, a place of having ascended to higher knowledge and they spoke downwards to those who are still striving upwards as it were um, now, if you uh, hold those ideas in your mind, um, then you will hear um, John specifically countering that in these words. This is from two, uh, chapter 2, verse 20 and then 27. But you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. OK, so it's not just, you know, the person, this Corinthus, who's kind of handing the knowledge down. You all have it. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. So um, I think John would say we need to go deeper into truth, but we don't need to ascend kind of upwards and shed um, the old ideas, as it were. We're not trying to move. Uh, we're not trying to transcend what we already know. We are trying to perhaps um, deepen our understanding of what we already know. There's a big difference between those two things. Um, verse 27, but the anointing you received from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie. Um, this language of anointing, which we've had several times now in those few verses, is, is called the language of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he says, you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, we need to be careful not to take this out of context, because if we do, then um, we will conclude, as um, people have concluded, that everybody um, is their own interpreter of scripture and that um, everybody's opinion is as good as, as another's. 
um, and that nobody um, has any will gain any benefit from sitting under the instruction of those who have thought long and hard and, and prayed hard over these scriptures. Now, this is not what John is saying. And we know he's not saying that because he himself is teaching the people. He has taught them and he's continuing to do so. But what he's saying is you don't need anyone to give you this transcendent truth, this transcendent knowledge to hand it down from you as something they have attained and you haven't, because actually it, it can you can all discern it, you can all discover it. You all have access to this truth and it is not to be gained by, by going upwards and shedding the physical, but by actually um, a deep understanding of the incarnation of Jesus, which is, in, which is in, in, inherently physical. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. So if we look at that in a little bit more detail, um, so one of the, if, if you imagined uh, from this incarnation thing I was just saying, if you think about Gnosticism and how that would work out in terms of its interpretation of Christianity, Gnosticism is not going to like the idea that God becomes a human and takes on a human, a human form and human um, characteristics and human um, body and so on. Um, and so out of Gnosticism comes um, the, uh, the heresy called Docetism. Now, Docetism is the heresy that Jesus, that Christ only appeared to be a man, that he kind of, he, he, he kind of, um, you know, he, he, he veiled himself in flesh, as it were. He, he kind of, um, but, but, but it was just an appearance. He wasn't truly human. He just looked like a man. Um, or um, there is a related heresy that um, Jesus and Christ were different, that Jesus is the physical man um, and that at his baptism, um, Christ, who is kind of, who is God, um, comes and unites himself with Jesus. And so kind of for, for that three years, Jesus and Christ are the same. But just before Jesus, um, Jesus, the man suffers and dies, Christ then goes back to heaven. Um, and this then disassociates God from the sort of nasty physical matter of walking about and bleeding and getting hungry and dying and so on. Does that make sense? So this is the, this is the Gnostic heresy. Now, holding all of that in your mind, though, listen to this. Um, 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This is John emphasising the physicality of the incarnation. He, he's, he's asserting his own status as an eyewitness, I think. But more than that, he's saying, I touched Jesus. I saw him. I heard him. He wasn't some shimmering um, um, pretend human. He was a real man. Um, 2 verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Can you hear that that is speaking of it against that heresy that Jesus and Christ are two separate beings? And chapter 4, um, verses 2 to 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God and is the spirit of the Antichrist. How do we test the truth. The truth is that Jesus is God in in the flesh and anything anyone who teaches differently is teaching in opposition to Christian teaching, which is what John's saying when he's using this Antichrist language. Um, now, as a as a, a consequence of this heresy, um, you can imagine that the cross, the suffering of Jesus and the death of Jesus on the cross will be downplayed because they're an inconvenient um, fact of history that really we want to theologically dissociate God from and our faith from because it's just it's a bit messy, really. Um, and um, and so John emphasises um, the death of Jesus. Uh, ver 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 2 verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. 3 verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And 4 verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins 
sins. So John is emphasising um, the, the, the death of Jesus because it is being lost as a result of this heretical teaching. Oh, and one more example of this, um, John emphasising the physical nature of Jesus Christ um, in 5 verses 5 to 6. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by water and blood. This is Jesus born of a woman with a rush of amniotic fluid and with blood. Um, now, another element of Gnostic teaching is that um, you can achieve sinlessness and that those who have transcended to this higher level have achieved sinlessness or something very close to it. And that allows them to look back down the ladder with a fearing, feeling of superiority towards those ordinary Christians who haven't yet got there. Um, and um, John then uh, really um, firmly counters this, chapter 1 verses 8 to 10, if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. These are liars, these are heretics, he says. If we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he says again, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. One commentator, David Jackman, says, um, comments on the relevance. Um, although we don't have Gnosticism today um, in, in the churches, um, that actually what John is exploring here is extremely relevant. He says this, isn't the heresy of the supremacy of knowledge as alive as ever it was? Don't we need to learn from John that it is humanity's sinful rebellion against God, not, his, not our ignorance, that is our chief problem? Now, I think Jackman is probably writing to some extent um, some time ago where, um, where I didn't actually check the date of this, but I think this sounds like quite a um, kind of modernity mindset. Um, which is the, the sort of optimism towards human capacity for knowledge and learning and understanding. Um, and, and Jackman is saying um, this idea of, of, of attaining um, great knowledge is central to, um, to who we are um, and we're much more interested in, in attaining knowledge and understanding than we are in confronting our own sinfulness and rebellion against God. Um, now I, I, that remains true but maybe um, I would add to that actually now that our indifference to truth is a characteristic of, um, of our current condition. Um, but I think John would have something equally stringent and does say have something equally stringent to say about truth. Now what's John's gold standard to test um, teaching against? Um, his, his gold standard is the historic revelation of Jesus Christ as given by the witness of the apostles. Remember, the thing about an apostle is an apostle is a witness to the resurrection, a witness to the teaching and uh, life and teaching and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so he repeatedly speaks about things that you have known from the beginning. This is not an idea of some um, kind of um, proto knowledge that was implanted in humanity at the, at the at creation, but that, that this is the original teaching. This is the true original apostolic teaching and everything needs to be checked against that. And so he says it again and again, chapter one, verse one, that which was from the beginning. Um, and then kind of, as it were, colon, and then, and then it goes on. Chapter two, verse seven, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. Um, verses, I'll come back to 13 and 14 in a moment. Um, verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Um, and 3 verse 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. Okay, so he keeps appealing back to this foundation, which is the apostolic testimony to, um, to the, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, going back to um, chapter two, verses 13 and 14, he expands this a little bit more because he speaks about um, being from the beginning and about truth that is from the beginning. But he writes twice to fathers. I'm writing to you fathers, verse 13. I write to you fathers, verse 14. Now, what's he saying when he's writing to the fathers? 
the fathers, uh, the, the older Christians who heard it from an apostolic source, the younger ones perhaps are hearing it from, um, you know, sort of second or third hand now, but the fathers in John's time of writing, they have heard it from John himself and perhaps from other apostles. Um, and so he calls them um, to, as, as another commentator, Gary Burge says, to rekindle their acquaintance with the ancient truths that the younger generation may no longer treasure. Now, none of us has access um, in that way of being first hand hearers of the apostolic testimony, but we all have the apostolic testimony in scripture. Um, and this was the this was the early church's test of what should be canon and what shouldn't was whether it had apostolic authority. Um, and so I invite you to think about that as uh, as as you um, work out what these letters might be saying to the church today and to us in particular. OK, so that's a little bit about um, one John. Now, the same the first John. Now, the same themes are in second John. Um, but it's much shorter. It's only 13 verses long. Um, so here he's writing to a church. I've already spoken about this chosen lady or his elect lady uh, language. The key word in this uh, in this book, in this letter, is truth. So he speaks about loving in truth, verse one, of knowing the truth, verse one, of the truth abiding in us and with us, verse two, of God's grace, mercy and peace being with us in truth and love this actually hold on to that we'll come back to that in a minute um, and then um, he uh, finds members of the church who are walking in the truth verse four um, what is truth uh, verse nine um, um, everyone who goes on ahead and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God this this idea of of um, of, le of transcending um, what brought you to faith and leaving it behind of um, I think I Howard Marshall another commentator has said and um, it's like climbing a ladder and then kicking the ladder out from be be below you and saying that none of that was really um, worth retaining and that but now with the truth I have attained to I've got to is the only thing that is, matters um, anyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God whoever abides in the teaching has both the father and the son um, so truth isn't abstract knowledge, it's abiding in the teaching of Christ. Um, now then, um, I said I'll come back to something and that was in verse 2. This is about God's grace, mercy and peace being with us in truth and love. Um, and John holds these two things, not just as a theoretical, um, um, two, two theoretical things that he holds, but he really does. As he, as he writes to this church... Um, and these people in all these letters, these people that he loves, he loves them dearly. Um, and he also strives fiercely for the truth and he sees no tension to that. Um, he sees no tension because he understands the damage that these heresies are doing. Um, that anybody who denies that Jesus is God in human form, that Jesus is, is, is God and man, um, is, um, begin, is, is pushing a stone off a hill, which by the time it gets to the bottom has become an avalanche, which will destroy um, everything that matters about the Christian faith. Um, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense. And therefore truth is worth striving for, it's worth contesting for. And uh, love does not exclude um, a fierce um, holding of truth. Um, and so verse 10, um, those who teach the truth are um, damaging. So, so who teach against the truth are damaging. And therefore, you shouldn't give them hospitality. Now, this doesn't just mean you shouldn't have them around to dinner, but it means you shouldn't facilitate their ministry. Because to um, in the ancient world, the ministry of a, a wandering teacher or whatever is only possible if people will take them in and feed them and house them for a few nights and send them on their way. So John is saying don't facilitate the ministry of those whose, whose teaching is damaging. And Tom Wright, um, talking about this idea of love and truth, 
emphasizes that love isn't the same as tolerance. He says, quote, is it after all unloving or intolerant to shout to people that the house is on fire? Or we ought we to tolerate people who come into someone else's house and throw lighted matches around the room? Is it intolerant to warn people that they shouldn't drive down that road because the bridge has been weakened by floods and might collapse? Is it unchristian to insist that if we're to worship the God we know in Jesus, we can't simultaneously be worshipping one of the very different gods on offer elsewhere? Of course not. Is it a failure of Christian charity if we warn people that certain styles of behaviour lead to ruin rather than to life? Um, end quote. And finally, a couple of comments about Third John. This is written to Gaius. As I've said, we don't know really much about him. We accept that we know he's being hospitable to early ministries and uh, to early missionaries, and John commends him for his hospitality for the reasons that I just outlined. Verse five is a lovely verse which speaks about um, strangers who are taken in and and become brothers or are discovered to be brothers. Um, this is John's idea of church as family. Um, and because church is family, because John loves it so much, he will do what he needs to do to protect it from harm, from false teaching. There's this character Diotrephes from verse nine, um, who uh, likes to put himself first and doesn't acknowledge apostolic authority and um, refuses to offer hospitality and therefore to facilitate the ministry of those who are truly um, teaching the, the, the Jesus's uh, words. Um, and John says, I'll address it when I come. Um, because he understands that it's the responsibility of those in leadership to, to make decisions, to protect the congregation from things that would harm them, to, uh, to call people to account, to bring people back to the truth. And everything John does is out of his deep love for the church. Remember, as he would have said, as he did say, little children, love one another. See you tomorrow for Jude.